Good evening. Uh, my name is Jenny Rathbone. I'm the member for Cardiff Central in the Senate, and I'm um, very pleased to be asked to replace um, Hugh Aranka Davis, who, since this meeting was set up, has been appointed to the government, and therefore he's not in a position to appear on matters not relating to his climate change portfolio. Um, he is with us listening and no doubt may ask a question, but he he's not able to, uh, to chair the meeting. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome a very illustrious group of panelists. Um, would you just like to um, go around and introduce yourselves, starting with Emma Cox. Emma. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, my name is Emma Cox. I'm Chief Executive at Endometriosis UK. Uh, Debbie Schaefer. Thanks, Jenny. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Debbie, founder of Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales. Thank you. Um, Professor Jackie Boivin. Hello, my name is, oh, you've just given my name. <laughs> Jackie Boivin, Professor of Health Psychology at Cardiff University. And uh, Dr. Jakovic. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm a lecturer in the School of Psychology at Cardiff University. Excellent. Uh, Lowry Shepstone. Hi, I'm Lara Shepstone. I'm Mid Wales Support Group uh, Volunteer for Endometriosis UK, and I also volunteer for Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales. And uh, Dr Emma Wyatt Haynes. Hi, I'm a GP in North Cardiff. Lovely. Uh, Liz Bruin. Hi, I'm Liz Bruin, I'm an endometriosis clinical nurse specialist based in Cardiff. And your colleague, Anthony Griffiths. Oh, hi, Tony Griffiths. Uh, I'm a gynaecology surgeon based uh, mainly in Cardiff. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, making time to join us on this call. Um, what we're going to be looking at this evening is um, the reasons for the delay in rolling out the endometriosis diagnostic tool, which obviously is incredibly important for any woman who uh, doesn't quite understand why she's in such pain and um, having such a regular or heavy periods. Um, and the diagnostic tool will help her understand that she may need to uh, get a diagnosis for endometriosis. So um, the, uh, we're going to start with the presentations and Emma, would you like to just, um, share the latest report um, um, from Endometriosis UK. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you, everyone uh, who's contributing tonight. Um, it's very much a, a team effort. Um, what I was going to talk about is the results of the Endometriosis UK diagnostic survey. Um, but I can just I, I start, please, by thanking everybody who contributed to that survey. Some people might be listening. We can't ever get the stats if we don't get your amazing feedback to tell us what it's really like out there. So a big thank you to everybody who's contributed to this or one of the many other surveys that I know we all do. So really much, very much appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm not risking PowerPoint. Uh, it usually goes wrong on my computer when I do. So um, what I was going to do today is I was going to talk through uh, the findings of our survey. Um, and I know there's lots of questions out there um, as well. And then I'll be handing over to, to others as well. So what did we find? So we did a diagnostic survey um, uh, just the end of last year. We had um, best part of 6,000 responses. But for this survey results, we narrowed it down to all of those people who said they've been diagnosed in the UK and are living in the UK, uh, diagnosed by a uh, NHS um, doctor. And the reason we did that is we didn't want anyone coming back saying, well, maybe you've not got the right people, et cetera. So we really wanted to narrow it down. So there's no, there's no, if you like, get out from the data. Um, we had that took us down to about 4,300 uh, 4, people. Um, we had a, a response exactly proportionate to the population across the UK, which was really interesting uh, to see. Um, and what we what I have looked at is, is the results in terms of a lot of the things that are identical in England and Wales um, and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Well, Northern Ireland is a little bit out on a limb because of um, the, the, you know, like a government at the moment, or the, has been, um, but there's real similarities in stats, especially across England and Wales. 
except one stat, which is in the in the UK on average for the UK as a whole, the average length of diagnosis time in 2023 has gone up um, since 2020. In 2020, when we did this, it was uh, eight years on average. Um, it's now eight years and 10 months. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is and what the excuses for that are rather than some of the reality as I see it. Um, and, but in Wales, what we found is that the um, average diagnosis time is nine years and 11 months. That's one year, one month more than the average across the UK. And as we all know, with averages, that means that um, things are spread out. So that means that for those people who get diagnosed in Wales in a year or less, and there will be people that do, that means we're talking about 18 years plus for some people today. This isn't historic data, this is today. Um, so I think what we really do need to work out as, as a group is how do we really kickstart diagnosis um, and improve treatment access um, to those with endometriosis in Wales. Um, and we um, know that endometriosis is a spectrum condition and it impacts on people differently. But we also know that unless you can get a diagnosis and access to treatment, that unfortunately for some, the disease may progress. And so it does feel like um, as, a, as a nation, uh, as a country, we are letting down, I think, our young uh, women and those assigned female at birth by not supporting them to get the treatment they need. And um, I would add, it's not all doom and gloom, despite what I'm saying, is we found that 10% um, of those that we spoke to had a really good diagnosis journey. So they um, had their symptoms recognised um, within, uh, within two, uh, two visits to their GP um, and they got a diagnosis in a year or less. So we know it can be done. Um, and I think what we want is rather than that to be the um, exception, we want that to be the norm. So what did we find in our survey? Um, so for some of you, this will be very, uh, won't be new to any of you who've um, been through this process recently. So we found that 74% had attended five or more GP, GP appointments with symptoms prior to diagnosis and a whopping 47% had been um, 10 or more times to their GP with symptoms prior to get a diagnosis. And also 52% uh, have visited A&E, but 26% had visited A&E more than three times. Uh, no one at the moment goes to A&E for a bit of a laugh, do they? You only go if it's really serious because everyone understands the pressure on the NHS and how difficult it is. So we've got 26% of people having to go to A&E three times or more with their symptoms without actually having um, them recognised in any way. Um, we also found that 20% reported seeing a diet a gynecologist 10 or more times before being diagnosed. Now, of course, that we know that endometriosis isn't an immediate thing. Um, you know, there's not no simple test for it yet. Um, but it does mean that we've got a lot of wasted appointments. So my argument would always be is surely between us, can we work out a way to encourage healthcare practitioners to, un to recognise and think of the symptoms and save the NHS a lot of time and get that real focus on diagnosing and treating people, not on um, looking at things that aren't necessarily the right cause. As I say, it can be done and we know it is done. So let's make that the norm. And um, I think the other thing is that we... Um, we found difficult and I'm, I you know I, I know that we've got people on the call who are exceptionally good and very positive um, as healthcare practitioners but we did find that 78 percent of our respondents who later went on to receive the diagnosis had at one point experienced one or more doctor telling them they were making a fuss about nothing or similar or had their symptoms uh, minimized or questioned by healthcare practitioners and that has gone up from 69 percent in 2020 to 78 percent um, and I think that is, uh, in this day and age, I think with the pressures on the NHS, people don't lightly go and use NHS services. So I think, again, looking at that recognition. And I think one of the other stats just to, to throw at you, and we, we've got all this written down so we can get out, is one of the other stats is around um, that uh, over 50, well, 30% of those people um, had symptoms and went to seek help when they were 16 or less. Um, 16 years old or less and there's this constant myth that oh you can you know you, you can't be that young to have it when we ask people to look back at well when you now know what are symptoms when do you think you had symptoms 56 percent believe they had symptoms prior to when they were 16 or younger and I think that really is a shout out that we need to be doing more to reach and educate those on menstrual health and I know that Wales 
Um, and and uh, I know that some of the work Jenny's doing as well, I know that Wales is looking at how they can ensure menstrual education is taught in schools. And I think that's a, a really vital area. So um, we quite often get, um, you know, people ask, why do we talk about diagnosis times? And I think it is important. And in terms of the length of time to get a diagnosis is we know that they've gone up. I think COVID might have, I think we all know COVID has had something to do with that. But we do know that the gynae waiting lists, the non cancerous ones, went up the highest percentage than any other list. Um, and I'm sure uh, Liz and Tony can talk about this. And the other thing that we're hearing a lot is that since COVID, di um, the amount of time that clinicians are getting in the operating theatre and to do treatments is, is less in some places than it was before. So I think there are some structural issues we need to look at. Um, and uh, I think for me, one of the things is how can we just get the NHS and NHS England to take endometriosis seriously. So that's my introduction, Jenny, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lowry Shepstone, what was your diagnostic journey? How many years did it take you to get the endo diagnosis? It took me 17 years to get my diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> but once I did get it, it's been really good since. It was just a long time to get it in the first place. Yeah, oh my it goodness. was not great. That I was one of the 70 odd percent that a GP said, you're a woman, you just got to get on with it, have some ibuprofen, hot water bottle. And I, for those, out of those 17 years, for 13 of those years, I just gave up going to see anybody about my symptoms because I thought nobody's going to listen to me. So there's no point. So I just powered on through basically. Yeah, it's not great. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so did you ever go to a &E as a result of being in such pain? Yeah, I went to A&E probably three times during that time. So I probably meet those stats that Emma have said. Um, and then I didn't actually get a referral to a gynecologist until I was 30 years old. And I, like looking back on my symptoms, I had symptoms from my very first period when I was 14. So, yeah, it, it wasn't great at all. But um, it doesn't help that living in a rural area in Powys, we don't have a general hospital. So we rely on consultants coming in from other health boards. And if they're not around, you can't see them, can you? And it's up to the GPs in order to refer us. But if the GPs don't understand the symptoms or don't have that bit of knowledge, then they're probably not gonna refer you in the first place, which is probably why I took to the age of 30 to finally get referred. That sounds really, really tough. Um, Emma Wyatt Haynes, how common is it for you to see women with symptoms of endometriosis? And how do you ensure that your colleagues, as well as yourself, know uh, what to look for? Yeah, good evening. Um, so, yeah, it's very common to see this. I have to be honest, I'm only right at the beginning of my GP journey. Um, I only qualified at the end of January. Um, I kind of fell into this because I did obs and gynae during one of my um one of my training posts whilst I was training to be a GP and then did some work with um, Robin. So I'm at the beginning of my journey. I probably have a slightly skewed view of everything because I have an interest in women's health and endometriosis. And so it's higher up on my radar. But I actually the last patient I saw today was a 17 year old girl who came in with severe, um, severe period pain um, with associated bowel symptoms, um, had had some improvement with um, uh, hormonal contraception, actually, um, but was still getting breakthrough symptoms. So we see it a lot. Um, I think with the probably with my cohort of GPs it's something that we're far more familiar with we're also very lucky in Cardiff that we have Cardiff Health Pathways which is an online resource for management of a whole range of medical and surgical conditions and on there we have a really clear pathway um, for managing endometriosis um, and as a GP now, we generally all have health pathways open on the screen next to us so that we can make sure we're following the guidance. So hopefully um, that's going to start to have a positive impact on, on our patient care. Thank you for that. That's really interesting and good to know that um, the Cardiff Health Pathways are helping 
Liz Bruin, um, you're an extremely experienced um, endo nurse. Lowry's experience is awful. 17 yeah. years is do you regularly get people who have I had that really much get, of a struggle i unfortunately i'm still seeing women in their 40s who were and the first thing i always ask somebody is you know tell me your story and let's start from when your period started um was that an issue did you miss school and i would say i get 95 percent response yes it was an issue and yes i missed school and so that's been going on for years and years and years and it's something which we really, really need to address and to stop because it's not fair. People aren't allowed to develop. They're not allowed to get the skills. They're not allowed to get the education because of this condition and because we haven't got the processes in that we need. Um, Mr Griffiths, um, you're obviously um, an expert uh, in s surgery where people require it. How can we... Um, how can we improve uh, the journey that people have to go through in order to understand what's going wrong and why they're in such pain? Yeah, I think there's, there's many kind of really interesting barriers, cultural barriers, how healthcare is designed and delivered, certainly in Wales, it creates its own barriers towards diagnosing and treating people in an effective way. Um, there is, I'm going to put a degree of ignorance, sadly, towards endometriosis care uh, amongst the whole of society, certainly. Uh, something that's really common, and yet if you ask 10 facts about asthma or migraine in a pub to people, they probably list a few, but endometriosis will say, I don't know what you're on about, or it's something to do with the worst term possible of period pains. But of course, it's not period pains, it's agonising pain equivalent to labour that destroys life, fails educational achievement, fails social lifestyle destroys marriages it's all this other stuff it's much more than just pain um i think as well as trying to get that information and the key to it is empower patients because the greatest change we have found is is ladies who really looked after other people by saying well i don't want my daughter to go through this i don't want my friend to go through this i'm going to empower other ladies to be vocal and say, well, no, I've got these symptoms. This is abnormal. I'm not accepting this is normal. And I think that's the key to the voice. Uh, there are other sad barriers that exist. Consultant contracts have changed. So the advocacy role of consultants has been lost because we're saturating doing essentially that work of other things. That, and so we're almost firefighting after COVID with limited resources, which of course is more difficult. Uh, health organisations, I'm going to say something really shocking, perhaps don't want endometriosis patients, um, uh, and which is a false economy in some ways, because as opposed to identifying and treating people early, that we have effective treatments, which is great for patient care. So what we are designed to do as doctors and healthcare professionals to look after people and actually diagnosis and treatment early avoids very expensive and unpleasant later treatments and for society the whole and certainly i've heard this comment many many times from operational managers and even medical managers saying please don't diagnose people with endometriosis because they require expensive treatments which we don't want to do so people are batted around health boards sadly because the money doesn't follow them and that that's truly awful uh, so i I, th I think that's uh, so there are barriers as it's not just ignorance there are barriers financial and sadly, cultural barriers and this that awful thing you've described that there we've got evidence to say that women are defined as less important than men, either consciously or subconsciously. But we've got evidence for that, which is truly awful. And saying that as a man sounds really awful, but we know that data exists. Um, and so I think we've got huge work to do. So given that level of prejudice, um, could I ask... Um, Debbie, Professor Boyvin, and Dr. Jakovitz, if between you, you could describe this new um, digital tool, which is going to empower women to um, insist on their rights, uh, both to be diagnosed and to be treated. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Um... So, yes, I'm going to start off um, the segment from uh, FTWW and uh, Jackie and Robin. Um, 
very much to to kind of address some of the issues that you've um that everyone's been discussing this evening rightly so um so essentially we're here um as part of the endometriosis cymru project and that is a collaborative team of academics patient advocates and designers dedicated to co-production and committed to improving endometriosis care for all of those affected here in Wales and beyond. Um, we came together as a group um, back in 2017 to 18 as part of a, a Welsh government initiated task and finish group for the condition. Uh, and that task and finish group was set up on the back of a report on gaps in care collated by the charity that I'm here representing, Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales. Um, and it was on that task and finish group where I first encountered um, Cardiff University's Professor of Health Psychology, Jackie Boivin. So since then, we have continued to work as a collective to advance women's health more generally through research, policy work, and developing and evaluating resources Many of these resources, and we're discussing some of them here tonight, were co-produced with our partner, Proper Design, a design company in Wales. And our collective has continued to grow and now includes, for example, um, Dr. Robin Jackowicz, who's going to speak shortly about the symptom reporting tool, but also uh, Rachel Joseph, one of FTWW's endometriosis champions, um, and who is now a PhD student who we are supporting to undertake studies in this area. Um, and would you be kind enough, please, to, to go on to the second slide for me? Thank you. So for those of you who haven't encountered uh, FTWW before, um, mm -hmm. we started life 10 years ago as a Facebook group and became a registered charity in 2020. We are a pan-Wales, patient-led and disabled people's organisation and we support and advocate for women and people registered female at birth who are living with long-term health issues of which endometriosis is absolutely one. We pride ourselves on offering peer support and information but also really importantly opportunities to get involved and have your voices heard in healthcare settings research and policy making. FTWW also chairs the Women's Health Wales Coalition of Charities, Researchers and Advocates, and it's the coalition's evidence that has resulted in a Welsh government commitment to developing a women's health plan. The coalition's evidence includes endometriosis, uh, and that's because it's a condition with such prevalence and impact that it has significant burden on patients and the wider economy. So I just wanted to say to learn more about FTWW and to get involved in the things that we're doing, please um, you know, look for us across social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, and our website. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Jackie, who's going to talk some more now, Jenny, um, about key recommendations from the task and finish group but importantly, how they are being fulfilled and their role in potentially reducing that diagnostic delay for endometriosis in Wales. Thank you. And uh, over to Jackie. Thank you. Um, Nos with the. Good evening. Um, so, um, First of all, uh, and following on from what Debbie said, thanks for the introduction, Debbie. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work that uh, the Welsh government has actually been doing on endometriosis because it's not everywhere that you can have the policy and the funding to pursue the kinds of projects that uh, we're going to present today. I also want to say that there's already many of the recommendations, the educational ones in particular I've displayed here, that came from the task and finish group on endometriosis that already are in good progress, such as uh, menstrual health education, the pathways, the specialist nurses that were appointed in 2022. Uh, but the content that I'm going to talk to you today about is the last one, which is the creation of online resources for patients and clinicians. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> 
So first of all, um, the government supported NHS Wales to dip, uh, through funding uh, the uh, Endometriosis Cymru website. So this is a co-produced website. Uh, and for us, co-production really is about involving uh, patients and users in uh, the development of the website. So first of all, uh, it involved listening to many, many different groups, many people with lived experience, uh, and many of the other partners uh, who are indirectly uh, affected. Uh, so parents and carers, uh, partners, clinicians, employers, educators that um, have experiences uh, themselves or have questions about uh, endometriosis or, or people who are affected by it. Uh, it also involved looking at the NICE guidelines and synthesizing and drawing uh, from a lot of information and then a lot of relevant research to think about what would be useful uh, in this uh, website and what could support uh, patients. And then working with our uh, partners, Proper Design, to uh, think about the design features that actually um, would... Uh, in a way, create something uh, of value that echoed what we were hearing from uh, the different groups we consulted. Um, and we also have, of course, easy read content, uh, which is in a way pioneering uh, in this area. Uh, and again, was also made possible by the Welsh uh, government's uh, support. Uh, could I have the next slide? So there are many, many different features uh, in this website, and we're just going to highlight a few today. And uh, Robin is going to talk in more detail about the digital uh, reporting tool. But uh, first of all, uh, when you go to the endometriosis company website, what you get uh, or what it provides really is evidence-based uh, information uh, to help people better understand the condition and the uh, treatment options, the different pathways. Uh, we've already spoken about those. Uh, support uh, tools to live better with the condition. Uh, so for example, uh, the empathy, the me and you empathy quiz that you can do with someone uh, to help them understand the impact of endometriosis on your life. Uh, there are other tools, stress and coping tools, for example. Uh, there's also uh, many stories, lived experiences told in people's own words uh, and focused on whatever it is that they wanted to fo focus on, uh, which is also helpful for people to understand the other experiences, but also as a form of validation, if you will, uh, um, of the experiences that they have. There's also many uh, uh there's a lot of practical advice and links to other authorized and trustworthy sources of information uh, and support. And as I mentioned, you can see in the blue, uh, for, for example, the, um, the easy read content. Um, but our star attraction in a way is the symptom reporting tool that my colleague Robin will talk to you about. And this uh, symptom reporting tool came about for precisely the reasons that we're all together here today uh, to manage uh, a delay uh, in people uh, at getting the kind of help that they were trying to get. Uh, I won't say too much about it, but all I'll say is that in the research, when we look at the research, diagnostic delay is often due to normalization, which we heard already. It's due to people thinking that it's something else, so attributing it to other conditions that have similar or overlapping symptoms. And as a result of that, people have many tests or get many uh, misdiagnoses, or also because it tends to be controlled uh, through hormonal contraceptives, for example, and the pattern of symptoms becomes somewhat different. And so the whole point of the symptom reporting tool was to help people to get the right kind of information to their healthcare professionals. And Robin now is going to tell you more about it. Robin. Thanks so much, Jackie. Could I get the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. Uh, so as Emma mentioned in her introduction and, and Jackie just referenced again now, the latest Endo UK report finds that it takes on average almost 10 years to receive a diagnosis 
currently in Wales, and research that fed into the task and finish report found that this translates to about 26 healthcare visits. Uh, we believe that the time and number of appointments needed to receive a diagnosis of endometriosis could be reduced with appropriate resources. Talking to your GP or another doctor about your symptoms is the only route for an appropriate referral within the NHS, but we also know that symptom reporting is not always optimal. So that's why tools and support talking about your symptoms with your doctor were recommended uh, by the task and finish report. So to realize this recommendation, our team co-produced the endometriosis Cymru symptom reporting tool, which we're excited to be sharing with you this evening. This tool is a web application that was designed to help users track the NICE guideline symptoms of endometriosis over multiple menstrual cycles. The tool aims to empower people with symptoms that might be endometriosis to seek health care. It aims to help you and your doctor discuss your symptoms and make decisions together about your care. And ultimately, we hope will lead to more efficient referrals when appropriate uh, to help reduce the time that it takes to get a diagnosis. So as of today, you can access the tool through the Endometriosis Cymru website. You can use it on your phone or on your computer. It's free to use, it's bilingual, and we hope very user-friendly. Oh, I, next slide, please, if you don't mind. Perfect. Uh, so there's three important features that I'd like to highlight about the tool. So first, when you create an account, you'll be invited to complete a medical history form that captures uh, any past tests or treatments that you've done, and will ask about key risk factors for endometriosis. You can also update this at, over time to keep track of your medical information. Next, the tool will prompt you to complete daily reporting of five key symptoms. Now, these are not all the symptoms of endometriosis, there's more than five, but these are the key symptoms according to the NICE guidelines that should raise suspicion of endometriosis by a doctor. Uh, and we recommend that you track your symptoms using the tool for at least two months. By doing this, this will create a chart of your symptoms, just like the example that's on our slide here. The tool also allows you to take note of any urinary or bowel bleeding and menstrual bleeding, which are represented at the top of the chart. So the chart summarizes both the intensity of the pain that you experience across each of these symptoms and how much this pain is impacting your daily life. In short, more color on the graph represents more pain and greater negative impact. This also allows you to visualize how your symptoms change over the menstrual cycle. So this person, for example, experiences pelvic, bowel, and urinary pain that primarily occurs around the time of their period. And then finally, you can download and print this report, which summarizes both your medical history and your symptoms so that you can share that with your doctor. The tool is for anyone who experiences symptoms that they think might be related to endometriosis, or it is also for people who have a diagnosis but want to monitor changes over time, for example, because they've started a new treatment and they wanna see whether it's effective for them. Next slide, please. So, so we come to a close here uh, through our, our introduction to the tool. I just wanna share some initial feedback that we've received on it. So this feedback here highlights how easy the tool is to use and how the tool helps to prepare people and empower them uh, for conversations with their doctor. We also have pr future projects uh, coming up to study the tool such as Rachel Joseph's PhD uh, and to create a mobile app version of the tool. So stay tuned for those. And I'm gonna hand it back to Debbie for our final slide here. Thanks, Robin. Yes, could we have the last slide, please? Oh, thank you so much. So, so just to conclude, essentially, we'd really like to invite you all now to use and share the Endometriosis Cymru website and the symptom reporting tool as widely as possible with anyone that you think uh, might benefit from them, whether that's friends, family, colleagues, employers, teachers, or your doctors, they are free and they're not just for people in Wales. So please, please go ahead. Um, for further information or to find out more about any of the other projects on which we are working, and there are quite a few, please just visit us on the links listed on this slide. And I'd just like to, on behalf of the Endometriosis Cymru team, thank you all very much for listening. And I'm now gonna pass back to Jenny, our chair. 
Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, well, all this is absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sure there are loads of questions. Um, so um, I can see various questions in the chat. Um, so I think the first question from HJ, the Welsh Network, is are you able to put a list of symptoms, including thoracic endometriosis symptoms on a trusted website somewhere? Well, we have the Endometriosis Cymru website. Surely that is the one, the go-to um, place. But it, the, the writer is saying it has a page for endometriosis symptoms, but not thoracic endometriosis symptoms. Um, which might help the public understand symptoms sooner. I don't know who would be best placed to answer that one. Is it either um, Mr. Griffiths or um, Emma Wyatt Haynes, possibly? Can I just, while you're thinking, Jenny, may I just um, step in? Um, so I think what's really exciting regarding thoracic, which is well long endometriosis, which is long overdue. So as people might know that, and um, we don't yet know the full um, extent of endometriosis, uh, in thoracic endometriosis, but it's considered the BSG have identified possibly up to 12% of those with endometriosis. Um, but there's a consultation out at the moment um, and it's for it's for NHS England, but it quite often gets mirrored in Wales. And they've actually specifically put in the new service spec for severe endometriosis that thoracic endometriosis needs to be dealt with and that there needs to be centres of excellence. So I think we will get there. I think it's a really good point that someone's made here, though. Okay. I guess from um my point of view yes it would be great if that was information that was on the endocumbry um website so that patients can get the one thing i always try and be cautious of is we don't want to um uh explain everything with endometriosis because thoracic endometriosis is one of the less common presentations and i wouldn't want to be missing something else as well so Yes, we have to make sure that endometriosis is at the forefront of our minds, but we have to also think of the other common things. Um, and I guess that's where I come in um, and other primary care practitioners to make sure we're keeping that diagnostic net wide and make sure we're co considering all the possibilities. OK, Jackie, you wanted to add something. Uh, I just wanted to add as well that um, um, the endometriosis Cymru website and the uh, symptom reporting tool are very much guided by NICE guidelines. And uh, of course, the guidelines are informed themselves by ongoing research. And when there's not a good representation, for example, they've, they're they not going to, if I understand from Debbie, they're not going to be focusing on thoracic uh, types or symptoms. That implies that there's not enough research in an area to, to say, make statements with certainty. And so echoing what Emma said, what we really need now is more research on this condition to be able to then feed into the guidelines with then greater certainty and that those guidelines can then be implemented in various places. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I think, definitely one for Mr. Griffiths. It's not uncommon for someone with endometriosis to have multiple surgeries. Is there ever a point in time when repeated surgery would no longer be considered an option? It's an interesting question. And it's one of the things we study in great detail, and we've got something called, and it's a statistical term, it's called a survival curve, which has got nothing to do with survivability. But it basically looks at how many operations you have and how effective that operation will be. Um, one of the problems we frequently encounter is many people have what I call null operations, an operation that either missed disease, and we know we've met many people who've been laparoscoped and have been understaged or even told their pelvis is normal, and yet we re-laparoscope them uh, in our endometriosis centre. We identify endometriosis and quite severe disease. So that's kind of a problem. So some people come and said, I've had four laparoscopies, but actually... They're null laparoscopies. They, they're not really done anything of any value. 
many people have that laparoscopic surgery has been ineffective. They haven't excised, cut out the endometriosis incomplete. And so there's disease left or they've burnt the disease by a variety of, of techniques. And again, that's got really high recurrence rates. So it's, so it's a difficulty to find really. Um, one of our interests is if you do have people with complete excision of disease, and we've got a large population base in the thousands of what happens to people over the last decade, and we've got evidence of what their prognostic value will be, depending on what type of endo it is, where it was. So it's kind of interesting variables you've got to put into that, really. So it's difficult to say to somebody, you've had four laparoscopies, that's the line in the sand, because that's obviously inappropriate. It's a bit more complex than that. Um, but I, I must admit, I always show this kind of survival curve of how effective your laparoscopy will be but I need to look at your previous laparoscopies. Thank you. Um, yeah, the next I question ask, I really, Can I just no. add as well that surgical procedures, are point, I keep going back to nice guidelines, it's very clear in there, it should never be just about surgery, that there should be other services available from get-go to go all the way through, and then it enables the surgery to be better as well. The result will be longer. But if you do it independent to everything else, then it, it disenables it. Thank you. Uh, sticking with you, Liz, um, somebody um, has a question about whether there's an endometriosis nurse in the Wrexham area. The post was advertised, but there's been no further update on it. When okay, will there so, be someone uh, in post? As you know, Jenny, we discussed this on Sunday. We did. Okay, there are actually two nurses covering North Wales. Um, unfortunately, and um, Debbie can back me up on this, um, they have not exactly been enabled to develop any services. And I think there's been a managerial focus on providing cancer care services and nothing else. Um, and it slightly baffles me because this is funded on itself, um, but they're not being um, a, they're not being allowed to. They're doing post that clinics, but they're not allowed to develop anything. They have developed performers. They've developed clinic pathways from primary care to secondary care, how they would do it in secondary care, but they're actually, there are huge boulders in front of them to actually provide that service, and it's not through lack of trying. So yes, there's no advert out because they are in post already. Unfortunately, they're not being enabled to deliver the service that they wish to, do, to deliver. And you know, I have great respect for them that they've stayed there and they battle every day to try and bring a service through which is not being supported. Okay, this sounds like something for the minister to pick up on. As it, Welsh government money has been paid for. Yeah, has been, they're, they're just, you know, yeah. You know, money, money's been made available for all this, and it's, it sounds like it's been hijacked. Yes. Debbie? <laughs> yeah, so it's just to say, and, and I know that, again, Liz and I often have conversations about this too. Um, I think it's fair to say that when... Um, when the post of endometriosis nurse was created for Wales, it was it's an absolutely bespoke, unique role. Um, and there's no role, so there was no kind of people working in that space that could be easily recruited into those roles. Um, so essentially what it's meant is that people have had to come in and they've had to do training and people have started at different sort of positions um, within the nursing framework and they've had to build up their skills and, and learn on the job, I guess, essentially. And I think that's probably another factor in as to why there have been sort of differences in, in what's been provided across the, the various health boards. Um, I think there's definitely hope. I know that there is work going on. Um, as Liz has said, there are pathways being developed and the aim is very much for patients across Wales to all be receiving equitable healthcare from their nurses. Um, so we've we just got to keep up the pressure, I think, and make sure that it happens. I think there is good news in that the Welsh Government has committed to carrying on um, funding this, but certainly as patient advocates, we will continue to just keep making the case that once all the training is completed, that all patients in Wales should be able to access an endometriosis service which comprises nursing um, in an equitable fashion without all of this variation. Because, you know, thanks largely, I suppose, to social media, we know that patients across Wales do speak to each other. So they do know what other patients are receiving and what, what they're not. Um, and so we've got to be really, really mindful in this day and age that you know, addressing that inequity is so, so important. 
Thank you, Debbie. That's really important. Um, moving add, on. Um, sorry, can I just, uh, Liz. Can I just add that if we compare, you know, uh, what's going on in North Wales, and then we look at what's going on in um, Kunta and what's going on in our, in our own Bevan, they have had, so those two, I think, are exemplary examples. They have the endometriosis nurses who have been in post since the beginning, and they've developed really good services, and they've got good pathways going, good communication going with GPs. GPs are ringing up asking advice. They know who they are. They know they're there. And that's half the problem that I've had throughout my career is people knowing that I'm there and they do know they're there. And, uh, you know, and it's very beneficial. And if the girls in North Wales, the two nurses in North Wales have been able to do this, they would have been, they would have developed a fantastic service by now. Okay, and I just, so I don't think it's just, it's, it's not a matter of skill. We were very lucky. You know, we were able to do a really good skills training course. So everybody had the basic skills. But what you do, you do need is you don't just need an endometriosis nurse. You need to have the network around you. You have secretarial support. You need to have consultant support. You have GP supporting, primary care nurse supporting to develop them. It's not a job they can do solely on their own. And that is totally reflected in the really good successful stories and the not so successful stories. That's a common thing. Thank you. Something we can take up outside this meeting. Um, I've now got um, somebody who's an ambassador for somebody else asking, my past you know, suffers from bad period pains every month. I've wondered if it may be endometriosis, but don't like to broach it with her, especially as she doesn't like to discuss her health and doesn't want to visit the doctor. What can I do to help and support her? Lowry, I wondered if you'd like to just come in at this point, because this sounds like something I'm sure you'd be able to advise this um, empathetic individual about. Yeah, it's first of all, it's really nice that the partner is like concerned and knows that something's not right, because half the time you can, as a woman, explain your symptoms to friends and family and potentially they just go straight over their head because they're like, oh, it's just period pain. So it's really nice to start with that this partner is concerned and they think it might be endo. I mean... A conversation is where you really need to start and we've got the support groups all across Wales now because it's not just me anymore in mid Wales we've got Wrexham and West Wales and Swansea and um, I think trying to get into a network of other people whether they're waiting for a diagnosis don't know whether they've got it or not or are intrigued as to whether they've got it or they're living with it talking to other people who have endometriosis and live with it every day is so helpful and I have made so many friends and had so much support myself since I was diagnosed it is literally just the best thing you can do is talk talk it out I mean it says that she doesn't want to visit her doctor or discuss her health but maybe if they found someone for example me come to my support group I will happily have a chat and explain well this is what I went through like we can't give medical advice but we can definitely give lived experiences of living with endo and maybe point them in the right direction of where they need to go. Very good. Emma, Emma White Haynes, how would you how would you deal with this sort of a person who's reluctant to disclose what what they may be suffering from? So in an ideal world, you I would have a number of appointments with a patient like this, you, you would have the time and space just to one, get to know the patient, um, which is one of the nice parts of GP um, and understand and try and understand how their health is generally and whether they feel that there's something impacting their health, something that they want to maybe optimize um but it sounds like that's probably not going to be something that comes out immediately if it's not something she wants to discuss um the difficulty and i guess this is part of the delay the overall delay in endometriosis diagnosis is how difficult it is to get an appointment with your gp at the moment um and it's not through lack of trying it's just the it's just the volume of patients that we we need to see on a daily basis and and so it does make it hard it's a it's a barrier to get over just to even get into your gp let alone have that 
have that kind of open discussion and build a rapport so that you feel confident to share your symptoms. Um, I guess what myself and my colleagues can do is try our best to make people feel welcome and feel able to have those conversations with us. Um, and by signposting to to various websites, including Endicumry, so that people know that there's support there. It just make makes individuals feel able to come and talk to us. Um, and we just have to keep trying to do that on a personal basis, even when there are lots of pressures on us. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh, I'll stay with you, Emma, um, because you mentioned earlier how uh, younger um GPs like yourself are more aware of endometriosis um, compared with um, older colleagues. And this question is about the lack of appropriate training for healthcare professionals in Wales to include GPs, emergency medicine doctors in A&E, mm -hmm. general gynaecologists, but also training that would mean Wales would have more specialist gynaecologists. Certainly, my reflection is, is that gynaecologists often have failed to diagnose um, endometriosis, which I find as a layperson quite difficult to understand. If you're a gynaecologist, endometriosis must be a key part of your work, given that it affects one in 10 women. Um, I don't know whether that's something you, Emma White, White Haynes, you could throw any further light on or whether somebody else can, um, to talk a bit more about um, it. I guess from the from a GP point of view, um, we're quite we are quite lucky as GP trainees that we get a lot of um, time during our training put to teaching, and I think that is maybe one thing that could come out of this. So there's lots of GP training programs across the um, across all of Wales. We have teaching every week, and that's a really good opportunity to disseminate this knowledge to this to kind of our co cohort of GPs that are coming through. Um, we want to learn about these conditions. It makes our lives easier if we're if we have the knowledge that we can help patients. Um, and I think it would be a positive thing to come out of um, out of us all meeting and talking um, if uh teaching sessions on endometriosis could be delivered to training gps um so that we don't have those barriers in the future and so that we all can manage it um and support people better okay just turning to debbie jackie and robin obviously the 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 tool endometriosis cymru isn't just aimed at women who think they may have symptoms it's also aimed at clinicians so um, how you, how, what evidence have you gathered so far as to how many clinicians are um, using the site to try and improve their knowledge and check on symptoms? Mm -hmm. Which, um, I don't know Jackie? who wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have the problem when there's three people on one project. Uh, so a few things on that uh, topic. Uh, first of all, uh, as you mentioned, it is geared, obviously, for the patient to collect data that would then be useful for the clinician to make decisions, whatever the next steps are. We don't know what they are. It's not a diagnostic tool. It's a tool for helping the patient collect information and bring it uh, to the GP So um, or whatever doctor. Uh, so right now, the point in development is that it was co-produced with healthcare professionals, including GPs and a variety of gynecologists. And the next step with the funding we have is to study how it's being used. And the first group of users we're going to look at is uh, the endometriosis nurses who use it a lot with patients. They use the endometriosis website and uh, to evaluate what what uh how that impacts the consultation uh period and hopefully we can in your next 10th year anniversary for the uh endo march we can report back on that great fantastic but why is it that gynecologists are not getting this training you know as as part of their normal training to become gynecologists that this is something i can't understand 
Um, either Liz or Mr. Griffiths have got their hand up. So, um... so, so some facts that may shock you, really. Uh, as an undergraduate doctor, you get told one paragraph, this is endometriosis. It's something you see down a microscope. Um, then uh, you continue your training as an undergraduate. You get two weeks training. That used to be six weeks, but it's now two weeks in OBS and gynae. So it's one week to gynecology. And our Royal College is kind of almost splitting in two. Our training program is mainly creating obstetricians mm -hmm. uh, and very, very few operative gynecologists. And we know we're going to end up with a crisis across the UK soon. So we've got kind of a specialist training program across the UK that trains people up to deliver endometriosis care. And in Cardiff over the last decade, we've trained about five people. One went to Taunton, one went to Liverpool. Two stayed with us, but were told they can't do endometriosis. They must do general gynecology. And one is just finished and probably will be pushed to England, which is a good thing in some ways, but not for Wales. Um, so it, it is an interesting phenomena. Why we are split and why we don't train gynecologists is a bit of a mystery for something that's so spectacularly common and needs resources. Okay, major issue that needs taking up elsewhere. Um, and uh, sticking with you, Mr. Griffiths, is um, I think it's a, a clinical question. Um, if if an endometrioma is noted during an ultrasound, but the individual does not have a diagnosis of endometriosis, can the first diagnostic laparoscopy be performed by a general gynecologist or should the patient ask to be referred to a BSGE? Mm, it's a corker of a yeah. question. Currently, they'd say should be referred to general gynaecology, but most of us who practice evidence-based medicine say that's probably a reason of resource allocation as opposed to care. If you've got an endometrioma, you're spectacularly likely to have severe disease. If you've got a bilateral endometrioma, you've got at least a 30% chance of having disease involved in the rectum and vaginal septum. So having an endometrioma, even without symptoms, is a strong surrogate marker of severe endometriosis. So mm -hmm. if you're planning surgical treatment, then I think it would be reasonable to go to see somebody who has expertise in that treatment. Because if we want to operate on somebody, we want people to have one operation um, in real terms and not to have these null event operations in real terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Emma Cox, you wanted to add? And thank you. And it's picking up on Tony's last point, actually. Certainly um, in Europe, um, where a lot more ultrasound um, is being used for diagnostic, and again, Tony and Liz can pick up, is, is there's a real move away from this a diagnostic lab, um, a laparoscopy, because why would you go in and have a look and go, oh yeah, now I need to see a surgery. Why would we have two surgeries when actually one should be done? And I do think um, if we can campaign and push for better gynecological imaging, so people trained to see um, some... So, a, 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 you know, a, a clear scan doesn't mean you haven't got endometriosis, but certainly where people are trained in gynae scanning and have the right kit set up properly, they can see loads more stuff. And then we're not putting people through a diagnostic laparoscopy and then another surgery. Um, and Tony, I'm sure, and Liz, I know in your centre you would be able to do that. But we've got this real postcode lottery of some people get great support and others might go well they might have a general uh imaging they might then have an initial surgery and i think we we sort of need to e even that out even just on money terms it would save money for the nhs and it would be much better for patients so maybe that's something we can all work on very good uh debbie yeah so i just wanted to flag up that you know, these are topics that are very much being considered now in Wales. So very recently, um, there's been a planned care programme um, created in Wales. And one of the specialties that is getting focus is, I'm going to say benign gynaecology in inverted commas, because actually, you know, we, we there's been a lot of discussion about misuse of the word benign and the fact that it suggests that endometriosis is, is kind of, you know, well, it's not cancer, so therefore it is, doesn't need to be prioritised. It's relatively harmless. It's friendly, you know, it's it's a real, real problem. So I'm using that word advisedly just to say essentially that the planned care programme now does have a an implementation network that is focused 
exclusively on non-cancerous gynecology and endometriosis is one of the key topics under consideration there. And I, I know from, from our conversations as an organization with the clinical lead of that network, that there are, um, there are plans to, to look um, at um, radiology. So to be looking at upskilling um, so that uh, gynecologists can confidently undertake um, ultrasounds, which, which really enable them to identify the presence of endometriosis. And that would be great if we could have real investment and upskilling there so that potentially, as you say, you could you, you would know exactly what you were dealing with even before you went and conducted a laparoscopy, which, as you say, should involve treatment as well as simply diagnosis. And I think the other thing that we, we really need to be tackling, and I think this will again come up in conversations within that gynae network, but also as the women's health plan is developed, because this is not just an issue affecting endometriosis, this issue of not being able to access care if it, if it is not provided within one's own health board. It is a systematic issue in Wales, which um, really does embed postcode lotteries. And we're hearing good talk from the minister in terms of regional collaboration. So the health minister is very much aware that it is a problem um, and then it needs to be tackled where health boards are actually empowered and funded appropriately to work together so that no matter where you are based in Wales, you can access a specialist centre with real expertise for your condition. And that with something as complex as endometriosis, that needs to be vital. And essentially what we'd like to see is in every health board that there is a suitably skilled diagnostic and, and treatment um, service, but that you would centralise expertise in particular pockets across the country and that you would enable patients, no matter where they are, to access that service in a timely fashion. And I think as, as Liz and, and Tony were saying before, ideally, if you have that pathway set up and implemented, you would reduce the number of patients going round and round that cycle of repeated ineffective operations. They would be getting to where they need to get much, much earlier on in their journey. And locally, that would be supported by things like pelvic physiotherapy for pain, which is another area that is massively in need of investment. And again, I hope that the Women's Health Network and the Gynae Network will work together, have those conversations, and we'll make it happen. That is certainly our aim as a, a third sector organization and the chair of the, the coalition. Thanks, Jenny. That sounds like you're really determined and you'll need to be because this is one of the real hot potatoes. At the moment, we have this one in, one out thing um, whereby if you break your leg in Swansea Bay, um, it, it, living in Cardiff like I do, they sort that out. And in exchange, they send us somebody for, with endometriosis, which is way more difficult and um, more expensive to deal with. Doesn't work, does it? So um, the next question is around the support available for those awaiting a diagnosis, uh, especially when it comes to explaining your symptoms to employers and getting in support at work for something you're obviously feeling really um, in a lot of pain about. Um, and uh, so, I wondered if, I don't know if this is one for you, Liz, as as the first line of support for yeah, somebody I'm who's struggling with it. <laughs> and the psychologists. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we what we didn't, uh, Debbie, miss out with the psychologists. We so need psychologist support and psychosexual, but that side, and we try, try to for, and, chronic, and pain clinics that we can access um, people that are not waiting like two years. There is tremendous waiting lists. Um, personally, as you know, I mean, I endeavour to answer every time that I can. Uh, we've developed clinics which can be self-referral or they can be in. Each health board is developing some uh, clinics which are very proactive and responsive to the patient needs. So it's responding to either emails. And in those clinics, they all be different, slightly different formats, but the, the purpose of them is to evaluate where the person is to discuss with them how they're managing their symptoms and try 
and enable an improvement while they're waiting for, most of them are waiting in, in Cardiff, most are waiting for surgery for a significant period of time. So it's to try and enable them to be able to control their symptoms themselves and improve their quality of life. And this is done by assessment, by listening, by evaluating what they're doing and what's good, what's not good, what's working for them and what isn't, and then coming up with ideas and often thinking out of the box. But a lot of it, I mean, I think it's a, the um, nurses in particular, particularly the endometriosis nurses, need to be enabled to be accessible and to be available to be able to talk and support. Um, but we have to be very proud in where, as I said on Sunday, I mean, we also have FTWW, we've got Endo UK, we've got some really good support networks which are going on as well, and it's, it's putting people towards those as well. Um, as an NHS service, unfortunately, we are limited at the moment. We have terrific issues with waiting lists, whether that be for clinic or theatre, um, but it's trying to address that as quickly as we can. Lowry, did you want to just... Yeah, just coming from the um, talking to employers side of things. So I am actually also the um, my employer's endometriosis champion because I uh, work for Powers County Council and we were the first local authority to sign up to be an endometriosis friendly employer. So getting your employer to do that means we've um, started initiating policy changes to include endometriosis because they already covered menopause. So now we've also got endo on the schedule. We've been doing internal comms, so spreading the word and giving toolkits to managers. So every manager in Powers now has um, all the symptoms, what to do, where to point their staff for support. Mainly it's to me in the Midwell support group, but <laughs> it is there anyway. And we have helped quite a few people already and we've only been doing it for less than a year. So I would highlight that as a way of doing it as well so that HR know what's available. And if there's any problems in work, then people know where to go. That's awesome. Uh, it sounds like we need to get the trade unions involved because they've got they've done a lot of work on on menopause. Let's get them acting on on endometriosis yeah. as well. Debbie, oh. yeah. So absolutely to echo Lowry down. I, I had a feeling that Jackie might be about to say this too, but we there's an awful lot of um, information now and tools um, on the endometriosis Cymru website to absolutely support with those conversations with your employers uh, and it does um, also link to uh, Ender UK's endometriosis um, friendly workplace um, scheme it also links to British Standards um, Institution which has recently published its own standard to help um, places of work develop policy and practice to support those who are um, you know uh, menstruating or having menstrual health issues or going through menopause so that's a really really useful um, piece of uh, piece of writing to look at but yes I'm, I don't want to preempt anything that Jackie was going to say so I'll stop there. Um, Jackie you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add, because the topic is stress and coping, I just wanted to add that waiting is a, a particularly demanding situation for people because usually it's uncontrollable and unpredictable. So there's nothing you can do and there's nothing you, you can't tell in advance how long the wait will be. And the stress and coping sections of the um, website um, invite you to look at your own ways of coping and uh, to look at also other ways that you can manage this kind of uncontrollable and unpredictable situation. So obviously, sometimes there's just nothing that can be done and other than look at the ways that you're, you're you know, the strategies that you use and whether other strategies could be used as well. Emma, Emma White Haynes. I think a big part of uh, talking about stress and coping and waiting for either a diagnosis or a procedure, I think a lot of our role as GPs is managing expectations now. Unfortunately, that's the reality of working in the health service at the moment. Um, things aren't going to happen immediately. And I think we do have to be honest with patients about that, setting expectations, but also giving giving patients information so that they can manage that journey yeah. um, and not making them think they're going to get a diagnosis and procedure quickly because then unfortunately they're going to be let down and that 
that makes everything a lot worse. And that's a huge part of our role now as GPs. Thank you. Um, the next, I'll take two questions together because they're both about um, the research to improve things. So the first one is, what is Wales's research contribution to finding a cure or better treatment options for endo? And the second is, are there any plans for experimental treatments, drug trials, um, any hope of new treatments in Wales in the near future? So I don't know whether this is something for Emma Cox. Uh, Emma's got your uh, hand up. Emma, go ahead. And then Debbie. I'll mute myself. Um, I'll start on the, the second one, if I may, which is around potential new drugs. And I think we all know that there's been a historic, complete lack of investment in women's health research. Um, and certainly menstrual health has been one of the losers in that. So we're down, we're down on luck. But um, I think there's some interesting things coming through, although we'd like to see it all done quicker. There are a couple of interesting new drugs um, coming through very early stages. I'm actually not allowed to talk about some of them because you have to sign, um, you know, whatever non-disclosure things. But I think we're starting to see, and in fact, we're starting to see some new trials around things that aren't just hormonal based um, for managing pain. But I would say there are early stages at this point. So it's going to be a few years coming through. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of different people. And again, I'm sure Tony and Liz can talk about this, a lot of people who are, um, trying to find a biomarker like a saliva test or blood test or urine test. And again, um, ignoring the claims are out, there aren't any yet that have been done, um, but there are people, there's different ones going through at different times. And also we've actually, the, we're starting to see some more calls for research um, on endometriosis and certainly um, in England, the National Institute of Health and Research has just put a call out for um, looking at um, uh, pain management techniques that aren't just drugs or surgery. Um, so there's a few, and there's some European level work as well. But uh, Debbie's got her hand up. Can I hand over to Debbie if that's okay? So at, at risk of echoing some of the stuff you've said there, I'm um, uh, absolutely going back to the, um, the the topic of biomarkers. So we know that there's been some really interesting work going on around that in Swansea, uh, Swansea University. Um, um, what I would say, and that's for endometriosis and PCOS. So what I would say is if uh, anyone listening wants to to email FTWW, we can potentially um, put you in touch with um, our Swansea colleagues who are leading on that work, if that would be of interest. But the other thing I just wanted to flag up again, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. There is some positive stuff on the horizon. And again, the Wales's Health Minister, Leonard Morgan, has now publicly committed to prioritising investment in women's health research. So we, we are, I think, at the cusp of really, really exciting times, um, you know, but obviously around the table here now, the virtual table, we have a responsibility to make sure that endometriosis is, is amongst those um, topics that is prioritised uh, amongst that, that women's health research. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. Leonard Morgan is definitely on the war pass and has told the civil servants they've got to stop doing something else in order to do more work on women's health. Um, so we need to ensure that happens. Uh, the next contribution is from the uh, Tony Griffiths fan club. Um, obviously, um, I can I because of time constraints, I suggest I we pass that on to uh, Mr. Griffiths. But basically, um, she says I would re recommend uh, Mr. Griffiths to anyone uh, who, uh, particularly because you uh, was one of the only doctors who ever listened to me. So um, thank you, Beth and Jenkins from Aberdare for uh, th that um, very positive message. Um, I think the next, there's a series of questions around patient pathways um, and improving patient education in order to reduce waiting times. Uh, and also the inequity um, around 
Wales, which we've already touched on. In fact, you know, there are better resources in Cardiff than anywhere else in Wales. And um, and this is somebody who clearly doesn't live in um, in Cardiff, but had a huge battle with help from her GP and her Senate member to get referral to Cardiff. Um, I and but sadly, she says I'm still waiting, and in the time between 2019 and now, I've had to get into debt considerably and pay privately for surgery just to have some quality of life. Mm. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not sure if there's anything that anybody wants to add to this, but this is definitely a perennial issue. Um, how long are the waiting list for surgery in Wales? We, we, we know that they're horrendously long for diagnosis. What are they for surgery? Right. Um, Emma Cox, your hand was up first. Thank you, Jenny. If you want your surgery comment answered, then in fact, uh, Liz and Tony would be the best people to do yes. that. I don't know if you want yeah. to go to them first. Um, so Liz and Tony, um, what are the surgery waiting times once you've got your diagnosis? It, it depends what surgery you need. Uh, I would say truly awful. Um, Pre-COVID, um, if it was 12 months, that almost seems science fiction, not even aspirational anymore. I think our current health board target is to treat all people within three years, but we've certainly discovered people who've waited longer than that, um, which is truly awful. And that kind of response of health board saying, OK, we'll put the shutters down to people outside Cardiff, for instance, um, when they haven't got access to other services. And I think one of the things we should pride ourselves in Wales is that we strongly believe in equality and equality to access of service. It doesn't matter where you live or where you are, you should have, even if care is poor and long, people should have a quality of service. And that we, we find that particularly great in as clinicians, I must admit. Yeah. And we have been severe, we still continue to be severely impacted with our access to theatre. And also if you then, um, if you're one of those uh, poor group that need colorectal support, that's an even longer wait, because not only do we need to get access to theatre, we also need to get access to theatre at the same time as we can get a colorectal or a urology consultant to come along with us as well. And, and that is having significant impact and delay, and that's a separate waiting list, which is quite extensive, unfortunately. But I think you know, throughout Wales, um, most areas have significant issues with waiting. I don't think many are as severe as ours, if I'm honest. I think centres probably, I think Swansea yeah. possibly have, you know, long waiting lists as well. But other okay. areas are not so bad. I mean, clearly we need to have more places that, that where people can get the treatment that they need. Um, people wouldn't be expected to wait for other things, so why why do they have to wait so long for endometriosis? Many, many levels of surgery could be you know, managed in secondary care. You know, technically, a lot of our cases in Cardiff are secondary care. We are a tertiary centre, but that's tertiary both for patients who are coming from out of area and patients who've got the more severe endo, but we also have patients who haven't got that more severe endo. You know, um, and it's developing, as we said, from going back to the old task and finish group. I'm not saying nice this time. Task and finish group, we clearly identified there the need mm -hmm. to develop locally people with skills to be able to do good levels of endometriosis care and, and to establish a standard diagnostic tool for when you're doing your laparoscopy. Mm -hmm. and these things are still not necessarily being completely identified. These uh, people in these hospitals have not been developed. But there needs to be, this is where we need to be going. It cannot just be a couple of centres that are doing it, because there's a lot of people that could be managed at somebody who has got reasonable, minimal access surgical skills and not necessarily going to be doing utilisers and needing the more advanced skills, but can manage more straightforward stuff. And that's what we need. And we need it to be reportable. We need it to be information that we share. Um, we had great dreams of having an all Wales group, didn't we? 
there we were. We had all the surgeons and the physios that we were going to employ and the psychologists that we were going to employ and the nutritionists that we were going to employ and they were all going to get together. We were all going to meet on a regular basis and discuss everybody in Wales who needed our help. That's where we need to get to. Thank you. Debbie wants to come in, then I'll go to Emma and Jackie. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jenny. So it was just to go back to the um, the previous question, actually, um, about pathways and about patient education and about how can I get to a service if I know that's where I need to go. So a, a couple of things. So um, I don't want to speak on behalf of Robin, but I am going to just flag up um, and, and Robin may want to come in, Jenny, if, if that's possible. Mm. But essentially, um, Robin is, is leading a study at the moment called the SPIN study, the severe period pain is not normal study. And that is actually looking at pathways um, for um, severe period pain, which could in, in many instances um, be endometriosis. And part of that study will be looking at the pathway all the way through from the kind of education that, that young people receive about periods uh, and severe period pain, all the way through primary care and, and beyond. But Robin, I'm sure, would be happy to speak more about that and indeed invite people to get in touch with her to get involved. But the only other thing I was going to flag up is, is the existence of FICE now in Wales, which is the, um, you know, the statutory uh, service. It provides individual advocacy for patients. They can essentially take a huge amount of burden off patients. And we know that endometriosis are really struggling under the burden of waiting times and fragmented care. Um, but actually, CLICE exists to kind of to represent you. They can chase up appointments for you. They can indeed sort of take up complaints and attend um, uh, discussions with you about those complaints, which may well be where you um, need to access a particular service and are being denied access to it. So they can really help and support you with that. So, so definitely do look them up if you're in that position. Thanks. So. Um... Does Robin just want to come pick up on on the work you're doing just before we go to Emma? Sure, absolutely. And and thanks, Debbie. You summarized the project fantastically. We're just getting started uh, very shortly in, in the data collection phase of a, an evaluation, as Debbie said, looking at the identification, education, and management of severe period pain care in Wales uh, across the life course. So starting uh, as early as education in schools through to people who have new onset of symptoms in the perimenopause period. So we're interested in what works and doesn't for whom. So it's a very pan Wales approach. Um, and the, the goal of this, which will include looking at routinely collected data using the SAIL data bank, which is a phenomenal resource for research in Wales, along with interviews with all of the different stakeholders from patients, educators, and healthcare providers um, to help develop evidence-based and actionable recommendations to optimize severe period pain care in Wales. So it's called the SPIN study. You can find out more information on our website if you're interested in that. So thank you, Debbie, for raising that. Thank I just you. want to um, say SPIN is severe period pain is not normal. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, thank Jackie. You. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Emma Cox. Um, thank you, Jenny. Um, I think uh, going back to the uh, the issues around access to care and, and this, if you get a diagnosis, what happens next? It is it, truly heartbreaking when you see people who've got, even if they get the average of nine years and 11 months, which as we hear from Lowry isn't always the case, is they think, you know, you think you've got somewhere and then you hear that there's another at least two years waiting on this for surgery, et cetera. And I think um, for me, I just, you know, what, what would be great is if we could actually get government commitment to drive down diagnosis time and actually have a target of an a average of a year or less by 2030. It is doable if everyone pulled their finger out or whatever the nice way of saying that is. Um, and I think the other thing for me is around getting some strategic planning um, at the NHS Wales level. And I know that those right things have been said, but we've not seen them enacted yet. And the thing is, when it comes down to it, we've got some amazing surgeons but the reason that Cardiff's grown up is because people have decided to do it themselves. There's been no strategic approach about how many cases need looking at, how many people on average need to be seen, what theatre time do we need? And that has been done for a lot of other things. And so, um, you know, endometriosis, and, you know, and it's not just endometriosis, it's gynaecology that isn't 
isn't babies or isn't cancer gets just knocked out of the system. Um, and I think that for me, uh, Debbie used the um, B word earlier, benign. There's this real um, myth that because it's not cancer, so doctors mean benign, meaning not cancer. The public hear benign, meaning, oh, it's just totally fine. And I think that that has a real issue around that. And so for me, it just feels, and I realise that everyone here is working really hard to change this, but it just feels that the NHS has got its head in the sand and is trying to hope that they don't have to deal with endometriosis. And we know, um, you know, I've spoken to teams across Wales and elsewhere that the, the, the after COVID, the teams just are not getting the theatre time they had before COVID and they're not getting the length of theatre time. So we know that sometimes people, certain hospitals are only getting instead of a full day, they might get a half day or but that means they can't do one long surgery and the long waiting lists are growing and growing. I realise we all say that, I'll try not to rant, but I think there's something around, um, and I know Jenny, you're working on this, and a lot of people are, but we we somehow need to get the NHS in Wales to do some strategic planning to look at the overall issues that we're doing and actually say, yes, we will need this much surgery doing, so let's allow for that to be done and plan it in. Okay, so th this certainly deals with the, uh, the next question, which was around what is being done to bring down diagnosis times if we set ourselves as a target of one year for diagnosis we can all then um you know work out what needs doing to make that a reality it seems to me that's a reasonable target mm -hmm. it, it requires a lot uh, more resource but it requires more people to be realizing that endometriosis is a major uh, condition and that needs a lot more emphasis on it if men suffered from endometriosis we wouldn't be where we are today uh so i think we're, we're sort of coming towards the end i guess one of the important final questions is um where will endometriosis cymru be promoted just thinking so that people who are not currently involved with support groups and endo charities can help to find it uh, can find it to help with their diagnosis and uh, how can it be pushed as a google search result so it comes near the top when people uh, in wales are searching for uh, information about endometriosis jackie um i think this might be a co-answer because deb uh, robin may also know the answer to this of course, our, our uh, colleagues, uh, Proper Design, uh, have done all the tech behind to optimize the uh, search uh, terms and processes. I couldn't tell you exactly what that is, but basically when people are searching for particular symptoms or particular strings of symptoms, that they get directed to the endometriosis cumry website. But we're also promoting it through all the different initiatives uh, with the government, all the way from like basic education to anywhere we can find. And Robin can say more about uh, other non kind of health settings through social media, et cetera. Robin, you wanna jump in there about how it's gonna be promoted? Absolutely. Do you mind if I cut the line, Debbie? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, just to say that that the tool just launched today. This is our first ever uh, event announcing it. Um, so, you know, from here forward, we're going to be working hard to share it far and wide, including across social media channels with the different charities and organizations that we work with. Um, Jackie and I also have done work with schools across Wales, for example, developing a free online bilingual course that is geared towards teachers and school nurses on severe period pain and endometriosis that includes some education around the tool, uh, when to sign posts to it, for example. So for, for young folks who may not connect to the tool through a charity, we're looking to embed the, the website and and tool in various resources such as health pathways as well. So it's more visible to healthcare providers. So lots of work in front of us, but it's also a collective effort. So please, as we said, share widely. Uh, you're welcome to share it, link to it. If you have ideas for, for groups that we could talk to about the tool um, or to share it with, we would be 
very happy to receive that. So you can reach us uh, through some of the email addresses that Debbie shared earlier. Debbie, Jackie, anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, I think you covered it. <laughs> Basically, please use it and spread the word. Exactly. Okay, so we've come to the end of our allotted time. I suppose just there are one or two questions, I think really quite specific ones um, that um, we haven't got to. Um, so could either Emma Cox or, or Debbie just, are we able to tell people that they will get a, a written answer um, to a, a question about um, um, endometriosis UK, you've got your hand up, can't see who you are. It's it's Lizzie, I, I'm in the background. The questions have been saved and we will be um, disseminating um, answers where we possibly can. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and obviously you'll send on the comment from um, the Tony Griffiths fan club as well. Uh, I just want to say that um, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. We have plenty of work to do. In the Senate, we will continue to champion endometriosis um, as, uh, as part of the cross-party group on women's health, which uh, the Fair Treatment of Women of Wales are uh, co-support. So uh, we've, we've had a really interesting discussion today, but there's clearly more that we need to do, um, uh, particularly around what's not happening in North Wales. Um, and, uh, and just really to try and get a endometriosis service for all women in Wales who need it, wherever they live. I think that has to be our aspiration. And I see several of you nodding on that front. So I th want to thank all the uh, brilliant uh, contributors today, as well as the really excellent questions. And uh, we need to keep going. Talk to Fair Treatment for uh, Women of Wales, by all means, write to me um, if you wish to. And um, we just have to get a better service. This is not good enough for our women. And um, we have to fight for those resources that um, will make a big difference to people's lives. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.